something like that. Okie doke. Let's get into grammar. We're going to go to page seven today. So go ahead and go to page seven. And I saw most of your work on the Google Classroom. You guys were doing a great job with your grammar. I saw that you had your parents check a couple things and that's good or whoever does your homeschooling. Um, so that's, that's what we're gonna keep doing is plugging away through this grammar book and then I'll post the key, the answer key. And then you can have whoever's doing your teaching at home can grade your grammar for you or have you look at it, however you guys decide to do that. But we're on page seven. We're talking about verbs today. A verb shows action, you guys already know that. And it links, that's another thing it can do, the subject to another word or it helps another verb. So we have action, linking, and helping. We talked about that last year. An action verb obviously shows action or ownership. A linking verb links the subject to a noun or an adjective. A helping verb helps an action verb or linking verb. The helping verb is always followed by another verb. So like was walking or has been talking or those types of uh, helping verbs that go next to another verb. Every verb has a subject. The subject and verb, SV, they belong together. So we're gonna start marking these now in this book for the subject and verb pairs. A subject is a noun or a pronoun that performs the verb action. So it tells who or what the clause is about. They have a little note on the margin here, verb test. So you can place the word in the blank to check it to see if you think it is a verb. I blank or it blank. And that way you can, if it kind of makes sense, I talk or it moves, things like that kind of makes sense with a verb. But if I say I blew, obviously blue is not a verb, so that doesn't work. That's just a little test. It's not foolproof. So, you know, there's other ways to tell if it's a verb or not. But we're talking about clauses this week too. A clause is a group of related words that contains both a subject and a verb. So that's different than a phrase. Remember when you underline prepositional phrases, those don't have verbs, clauses do. And then there's several different types of clauses we're gonna learn this year. And the main clause contains a subject and verb and expresses a complete thought. So it can stand alone as a sentence. Every sentence must have a main clause. So every sentence has to have a group of words that can stand all by itself and still make sense. So you're gonna read the sentence and look for the verb, ask who or what, and then mark it with a V for verb and the S for each subject, and then place square brackets around the main clause. Here's your example, the tiger knew the laws of the jungle. Brackets. The subject is tiger, the verb is new. And sometimes we start with a verb because those are a little easier to spot. And then you can ask who. So who knew it was the tiger to find the subject. The sentence opener is a descriptive word, phrase, or clause that is added to the beginning of the sentence. You guys remember that from, I know a lot of you were in my class last year. I think Aubrey, you're new, but you've done this before. So you probably remember too. Um, just talking about sentence openers using different ones can help make your writing more interesting to read. And um, it says here, after you mark a sentence, determine if the sentence begins with an opener that you know. If it does, mark it. Do not mark questions or quoted sentences. So we're starting with the number one subject opener. And that is an, a sentence that begins with the subject of the sentence, just like it says. It might have an article in front of the subject and that's okay. It still would be considered a subject opener. Like this here, this example, a young boy wandered from his village actually it has a, which is an article. And then it has young, which is an adjective, but still the first main part of the sentence here is the subject. So it's still considered a subject opener. And then wandered is the verb from his village. And you mark it with a one. Any questions about this page here? 
If not, just shake your head no for me. So I know you don't have any questions. Okay. And then I, before we turn the page, this is a handy dandy list here of your helping verbs and linking verbs. You um, can put a post-it on this page to refer back to if you need to for those words. There's a little more on the back, page eight. Strong verbs. That sounds like a dress up that we will have soon. Strong verbs dress up writing because it creates a strong image or feeling. A strong verb is an action verb. It's never a linking or helping verb. Look for the strong verbs in this book and write them on the strong verb collection page on appendix two. So in the back of this book, there's a place for you to make a list. If you come across some verbs that you're like, wow, that's an awesome verb. I love that verb. I wanna use that verb later. You can write it down. It happens sometimes. Okay, here's your example. Oh, I skipped this part. Usage with pronoun agree agreement. A pronoun replaces a noun. We already know that. He, she, it, they, them. In order to avoid, avoid repetition. An antecedent is the word the pronoun refers to. So look at this example. The boy wandered. He did not hear his mother's call him his mother call him. The personal pronoun he, his, and him refer to the noun boy. The noun boy is the antecedent of the pronouns he, his, and him. So they're making it clear, there's a lot of pronouns in here that all of them point back to the boy. And this one's pretty easy because the boy is a boy and the mother is a girl. So that makes it pretty easy to spot, but if it had dad in there in, instead of mother, it might be a little tricky figuring out what pronouns go with what subject or what antecedent. So a personal pronoun should agree with its antecedent in number. Number means one singular or more than one plural. And here's a chart for you. Um, and these are different pronouns that you can use in different situations. Here we have first, second, and third, that's person. Remember we used to talk about when you play Minecraft or some video game, you can play in first person where it's you, what you see, that's, that's I, me, my, mine, that all has to do with you. Second person is you can see the person, but it, you're not looking from that person's perspective. It's a different character or a different person. So you, you, your, yours, and then of course, if it's completely separate um, and you're talking about somebody else, he, she, it, him, her, it, his, her, its, his, hers, its, and then plural down here. These are all the pronouns in our English language. This is a good page to refer back to if you need to. Um, and then you've got the, the subject, object, and then possessive belonging to someone. The boy wandered. He did not hear his mother call him. The boy refers to one boy. Therefore, only the pronouns with a singular row can replace the word boy. So this row right here, singular. The boys wandered. They did not hear their mother call them. So since boys is now plural, more than one, the, the plural row, this is the row of pronouns you would use for more than one. You guys pretty much know this because it sounds, you can hear it, it sounds right. Okay. Um, you're gonna see errors in this book and this is how you're gonna fix it. So look at the very bottom of your page here. Um, the wolves obeyed the law, they could endanger others if they did not. A wolf learned the law as a cub he obeyed it always. So the pronouns are all messed up. Basically you draw a line through it and write the correct one above it. Any questions about all these wonderful pronouns? Okay. Go ahead and go to the practice page, page nine. Anybody feel like reading it today? Any takers? No takers? Okay, Kylie, go for it. Thank you. Um, the desperate villagers feared the beast. He would send elephants and men with guns and tor 
torches into the jungle to kill them. So we're already coming up on some drama in this book. Did anybody read the whole story in the back of the book yet? It's back there. You did, Kylie. So she knows what's going on. You don't have to, but it's back there. It's kind of fun. Uh, anyway, desperate is our vocabulary word. And you probably know the meaning. We've been desperate before. Maybe you're like desperate for food if you're really hungry. Having little or no hope. So it's a little more than a food desperation. It's like, you know, desperate in life. You need something. Having little or no hope. Hopefully none of us have to go to that. Jude, did you have something to say? Yeah, I just wanted to let you know my IEW book still hasn't arrived yet. Oh, okay, darn. Um, <laughs> you don't have this. Does anybody else not have their book yet? Okay, so you, so uh, I think just maybe on a lined paper, you can copy that and then I will send you, I'll make a note to myself. Thank you, Jude. I, I think your mom emailed me or messaged me this morning, but then I didn't get a chance to send it to you. Okay. Just making a note here. So yeah, if you could copy it down and then fix it on your lined paper and that'll be okay. Articles, you know what those are. Let's just write them in for now. A, an, and the, go ahead and find those and label those. Nouns, Alex, seven of them. Villagers. Okay, villagers is one. Beast. Yep. Elephants. Yes. Men. Yes. Guns. Yes. Torches and jungle. And jungle. Awesome. Very good. By the way, Jude, if you um, don't have them by next week, so today's Tuesday, maybe you could let me know by Sunday. And then that gives me a day to get all this stuff to you. Okay, cool. Pronouns, how about Matt? Where are the pronouns at? And I need you to turn your camera on when you get a chance. If you're there, oh, there you are, okay. That's okay. He. Okay, good. And men. Men is a noun. Okay. Uh, then I'm looking for a pronoun. Them. Them. There you go. And actually, we're going to have to fix this one because really it says the desperate villagers feared the beasts. He, but see, we're talking about villagers plural and beasts plural. So we need a plural pronoun here. What do you think we should put, Matt? Instead of he... Uh, if it's more than one, if it's more than one villager or more than one beast, it's going to be the villagers. So if it's villagers plural, what kind of a pronoun would you use to refer back to them? Uh, them. Or them um, would send elephants. Does no, that sound good? They. No. There you go. So let's draw a line here and squeeze in the word they. Good. That's what it should be. They would send in elephants. And then um, this is a strategy, Aubrey, that we use. Sometimes we skip the prepositional phrases and come back to it because it makes it a little easier to find if you struggle with that. If not, you can just go down the list. But I'm going to skip and go to main clauses. So, um, Aubrey, do you know where the main clause is in these sentences? There's two of them. They're going to have a subject and verb. Actually, you know what? Before you tell me that, let's back up for a minute. Let's find the verbs next. So, Aubrey, where are the verbs or the action words, helping verbs, linking verbs? Okay. Feared is a verb. Good, good. And how many are two verbs? I don't know. 
two. Well, it says two subject verb pairs. Sometimes that just tells how many subjects, but I'll tell you there are three verbs in here. Okay. So sometimes there's um, more subjects or verbs than subjects. Send. Okay, send, yes, that's a verb. Mm -hmm. Kill. Um, because we have this word to right here, to oh, kill, okay. yeah, it changes that. Mm -hmm. But um, there's one that's like a helping verb right next to send. Right before it, actually. A oh, wood. That? Yes, Sorry. wood. That's okay. No, you got it. Yeah, to kill. Um, it's whenever you see that word to, it changes it. So I'm looking for. Um, I'm drawing a blank on what that word is, <laughs> but we'll come back to that because we'll have more of those for sure. But anytime you see that word to next to it. All right, so let's look for the subjects now. So Kylie, who was it that would send? Who's the subject in that sense? Or let's go back to the first one. Who the villagers. feared? The villagers feared. It's another subject for this part. Okay. Yeah, good. And then let's go back to main clauses now. So um, Jude, how about main clauses? Remember they have subject verb pairs in them too as a complete thought. And there's two of them. Okay. Um, subject and verb. Mm -hmm. Like a complete thought. Can you show me the first one real quick? Yeah. Yeah. No problem. It's actually going to be the, the whole first sentence right here. Okay. A lot of times it is the whole sentence. So we have the desperate villagers, that's the subject, feared, and then what they feared. So it's got to be a complete thought. Okay. A lot of times it is the whole sentence. That's a big clue. So um, we start at he then, and then yeah. we end at torches or at the very end? At the very end, actually. Oh. Good question, though. Um, because it's telling a complete thought, so and it contains a subject and verb pair. That's good. Um, now we've got prepositional phrases. Um, Alex, where are the prepositional phrases? Um, into the jungle. Good, that's one. And with guns and torches or to yes. kill them? No, that's correct. With guns and torches is correct. Because it does um, to kill, it's it's not a verb anymore. It's a and I can't think of that word. Why am I drawing a blank? <laughs> oh, that's gonna bug me now. Do you guys remember what that's called when you have two in front of it? Oh my goodness. Uh oh, it's an infinitive. That's the word. Okay, I feel better now. It's called an infinitive, so it's not. Uh, considered a verb but an infinitive so it's not going to be part of a prepositional phrase okay moving on moving on openers we've got two sentences here so matt what are the two openers we only know one opener so far you're muted so i don't know what you're saying subject Subject. And what number is it? Number one. Number one. And we'll write subject next to it. And what about the second sentence? Um, it's also subject, I think. Also subject, yes. All right. Capitals. We got the first letter of the sentence. You guys already got that first letter of that sentence. End mark is a period. And we already fixed the usage error, which was he, we changed it to they. Kind of sped up there at the end, but that's good. You guys have any questions about this page? So remember, you can move around on your list, find the ones that you know first, and then the ones that you're struggling with, you can take your time on and do those after. Um, and your homework is pages 10, 11, and 12. All right, good. Go ahead and put your grammar books away.
And now we're going to get out your binders. And I saw that you did your KWOs um, for the Maori. And I'm just going to have you guys practice retelling that to me for a minute before we move on to the next week. So just go ahead and get out at all that you have your KWO for Maori and whatever you have for week one. I saw that your parent or somebody signed it. That's good. That tells me that you practiced it. So what I'm going to have you do is just practice like three lines at a time so that everybody gets a turn. And I don't want to take too long with it, but actually four lines. <laughs> so I'm going to start with Matt. Remember how we did this um, last year where you look at your outline, okay? You have it in front of you, okay? And your first three words are something like indigenous New Zealand or something like that. So you're gonna look at your words, think of a complete sentence and then look up at the computer and say the sentence, okay? So go ahead and do the very first one for us. But I have to see your face because you've got to look at the words, think of a sentence, and then look up at me. Okay. Um, so just read like number one of Roman, Roman, no, Roman numeral one. Yeah. So what do you have there for Roman numeral one? Uh, legend, uh, Hawaki equals Tahiti. For Roman numeral one? Yeah. Or no, I'm sorry. For now, we're going to I have indigenous people, New Zealand. Okay, perfect. So yeah, look at those three words, indigenous people, New Zealand. Think of a complete sentence and then just say the whole sentence. Um, but you have to look at me when you say it, okay? The Maori are the indigenous people of New Zealand. Perfect. Good job. Now move on to Roman numeral, I mean, regular numeral one. Look what you have on your outline. Think of a sentence and then look up at me. Put the camera a little bit more on you so I can see your face a little better. There we go. Uh, and then tell me a sentence. Legend says Hawaii might be Tahiti, the uh, homeland of Maori, the Maori. That was pretty good, but you were looking at your paper. So try to remember the, the what we're practicing here, guys. I know this is kind of new to you, some of you. But you're memorizing, basically. You're looking at the words, and then you're thinking, how can I make this make sense? And then you're looking at me and using your brain to tell me. So I want you to try to do it without looking at your outline. And the rest of you can be practicing in your own head while he's doing that. But try it one more time, Matt. Um, sorry. Le Legend says that uh, the... Maori's original homeland is Hawaii, and scientists think that Hawaii might be Tahiti. Okay, good. See how you created your own sentence is different than the original, which is good. All right, one one more. I'll just have you do three. The next one, regular Roma, numeral two, not Roman numeral two, but numeral, just the second one. Um, it talks about the 1800s. In the 1800s, the British fought uh, seven wars with the Maori Indians. Okay. Try that one more time, not looking at your outline. The In the 1800s, the British fought seven wars with the Indians. Okay. All right, let's move on to Kylie. Can you do, under Roman and Roll Run, can you do three? Make sure you unmute too. Okay, that's my chicken stuff, of course. Um, and you can peek back at the original if you need to remind yourself what that was about. That's okay with me. Oh, okay. After the wars, um, oh, I'm just kidding. That's okay. It takes practice. The issue surrounding the Mari land or whatever, like the Mari, I can't yeah. say the name. Um, Mari, yeah. Yeah, surrounding the Mari traditional land is still difficult to resolve today. 
Okay, good. I like it. Good job. And then go ahead and do Roman numeral two. <clears throat> the Mari element uh I'm never good at reading, sorry. Oh no, you are good, Kylie. It's okay. It's because it's been a while since we've done this. Once you get into the groove, it gets easier. So don't feel bad. We're like we're family in here, okay? Yeah. The original says Mari culture has several elements that might not be familiar to people of other countries. So it's talking about their culture is unfamiliar to other people. And several elements just means like parts of their culture, basically. Okay, so try that one more time. Okay. The Mari elements were different are are different than most countries uh, are accustomed to. Okay, that's good. And I think you need the word culture in there because the elements of their culture, that's, that's important. So, but you're on the right track. I like how you did that one. That was good. And then how about regular one under that about how they press noses <laughs> together? For example, the Mari would uh, greet each other by pressing noses. Nice. And I, I liked how you used. Oh, I missed that last part. What did you say? I said, which is weird. Which is weird for us, huh? <laughs> I'm kind of glad we don't do that. That is kind of weird. But um, yeah, I like how you used, for example, that was a good way to put that. Okay, Alex, how about number two on that? On number one? Yeah, no, under Roman numeral two, number two. Okay. The Mari carved houses for their ceremonies. Good, except for you forgot to look up at me when you said it. So try to look up at me when you say it. Um, the Mari carved houses for their ceremonies. Good. It's harder, huh? When you can't look at it. So that's the trick. Okay, good. I like that. And then go down to three about the Hakka dance. They also practice a Hakka, a dance called Hakka. You forgot to look at me. Try it one more time. <laughs> they also practice a dance called haka. There you go. Perfect. Nice. And then one more, number four. The haka dance includes stamping, stamping and loud chanting. Nice. Good job, Alex. Okay, Aubrey, I know this is new to you for me, for my class, but see if you can do the next one that talks about it's number four under Roman numeral two about the slapping and tongue thing and all that part of the, let's see what the original says here. Um, let's see. Oh, the haka involves a great deal of foot stamping, protruding tongues, rhythmic body slapping and loud chanting describing ancestors or events in a tribe's past. So look at your keyword outline at the keywords you have. Try to think of a complete sentence and then look up and say the sentence. The Hakka involves a lot of Sorry, that's my brother's time before. Everything mm -hmm. involved a lot of foot stamping, protruding tongues, rhythmic chanting, and yelling. Nice. Okay, perfect. That's good. And then try the next one, number five. The, what's, how do you say the name? I think it's Moko or Mako. I'm not sure, but either one of those would be okay. Okay. They used a, they, wait a minute. The Maori put tattoos called Moko on their bodies to describe their ancestry. 
Okay, good. Try that one more time. You got it. Try that one more time without looking at it. The Maori used moko tattoos to describe their ancestry. Nice. Good job, Aubrey. That was good. And then one more, number six. The moko could also show social status and eligibility to marry. Okay, good. Nice. Nice job. And the reason why we practice this is because it's going to help you when you get to that point of writing these paragraphs. But it's good to be thinking of a complete sentence and then practicing looking away from it. So Jude, do you have your keyword outline in front of you? You do. Okay, so go ahead and do that very last one, number seven. I'll have you do a couple others too. Actually, you know what? You do five, six, and seven. How about that? Okay, okay. So go back up to five about the tattoos. Okay. Um, the they have Mako tattoos that are from their history. Let's see. Okay, but you have to look at me, remember? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you have to look at the words, think of a sentence, and then, then look at the You don't want me to look at the actual story either, though, right? You can check if you need to go back and look at it to remind yourself that's okay with me. But yeah, when you say the sentence, you got to look at me. Okay. The Maku have um, tattoos as part of their history. Okay, good. Okay. That's good. You said history instead of ancestry, but that's okay. It still makes sense, yeah. So go on to number six. The maku could also affect their status to marry. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Yep. Or it, maybe it shows their status instead of effect, but you got, that's good because it tells, man, can you imagine getting a tattoo? Those are pretty permanent. I'm pretty sure <laughs> if you're eligible to marry, that's interesting. But anyway, uh, and then try the last one, number seven. The men usually put them on their, um, mm -hmm. that's okay. You can check it again. The men usually put them on their faces, back and thighs. Okay, good. Nice. All right, you guys, good job. I, I wanted to make sure to practice that. So hopefully you had a chance to do the whole thing with your parent because that was what I wanted you to do for your homework It's good practice for your brain to look at those keywords and then to formulate a sentence and then to say it by looking away from it and looking up. So nice job. So let's go ahead and put away week one. The first page I want you to put away is that yellow page. So let me share my screen because we have several things to kind of organize in our binder before we get out week two. So that yellow page um, just is an outline, a sample outline. I'm talking about this one. That one's going to go behind model charts and outlines. So find the tab that says model charts and outlines and stick that yellow page behind that tab. Whoa, everything's falling here. This tab here says model charts and outlines. Put it behind that. I don't have enough room at the space that I'm in right now, so I'm just going to move it out of the camera and make sure you click it in, in your rings, close up your rings. What else? If you have a separate binder that you're putting your finished work in, you can put the rest of the stuff in that separate binder you have or folder. So basically the Maori, and even though we didn't read these others, Cherokee and the sand, people, that's okay. I still want you to put all of this away. This is from week one in a separate binder or folder, wherever you're keeping your 
finished stuff. And then the KWO for that. Last year, we put it back in the same binder, but then it kind of exploded on us. So <laughs> this year, we're going to try to do it. Put it somewhere else. And then when you get all that put away, go ahead and go back to source text tab, which is that first tab here at the front and get out week two starts on page 19 and go ahead and get out. It's kind of a lot. This one's pretty long. You're going to go all the way to page 32. We have a lot to cover. Go ahead, Kylie. What if I don't have a separate binder? Can I just put it under finished compositions? You can for now. I'm okay with that. But I do okay. want you, to, next time you're at Walmart, maybe get a binder or you can get, have you seen those accordion folders that open up and you can slide papers in them? Those are cool too. You can use that somewhere to put them outside of this binder though. But for now, that's fine. And you will need a lined piece of paper. So go ahead and get that ready. And then once you get week two and a lined piece of paper out, go ahead and give me a thumbs up. Got that, I see that. So some of the passages we skip because um, some, some weeks we're gonna slow down a little bit. In fact, this one we're probably gonna take two weeks on. So some of them we slow down and some of them we go a little faster, so. That's just how I do this class. We don't actually do every page. And Jude, I'm sorry you don't have this, but I will try to get it to you today, but you can at least see what's on the screen. Okay, I see that, Aubrey. Matt, when you get a chance, turn on your camera, please, too. And once you get all this out, I do want you to start with the yellow page, page 23. So we're going to look at that page first. So you can set it on top of your stack. Okay, you all set, Matt? Uh, what, I have, how many pages do I have to take out? Take out all of week two. So it goes all the way to page 32. Okay, thank you. Let me do that. Okay. Real quick. You guys probably remember this from uh, last year, but this is our page that we start adding dress ups and stuff to. We've we had it full pretty much, pretty close to full last year. So we're starting with dress ups. Um, and go ahead and keep getting your stuff ready, Matt. I'm going to get started though. So listen while you're getting your stuff out. The very first one next to one is going to be L-Y adverb. So we'll write that in first. We're going to talk about that today. And number two is the who slash which clause. Oops. P-L. There we go. Those are the two we're going to focus on this week. So we will start writing this week. Um, and But we're going to use the KWOs like we always do. When you go to the writing part, though, you need to make sure to include an LY adverb and a who, which clause. Just a quick remember, like a reminder. <laughs> LY adverbs tell how something is, like um, slowly, he was slowly eating the cake because it was so delicious or so rich. But it's telling about how somebody is doing something, putting an L-Y adverb in front of it. And it's kind of handy that they call it an adverb because it really does add to the verb, which is nice. So that'll help you when you're looking for a spot to put an adverb in your sentence, look for those verbs and show how they're doing it. And then, of course, the who, which clause. A clause, like we said earlier, has a verb. So you're going to use who or which, remember who is talking about a person, or if it's a character that's not a person, maybe it's an animal that talks, you know, maybe you're working on a story, a fantasy story, you still would use who, which is what you use about a thing or a place, something like that. So the, those are the two ways to use those. Um, you can also use words like whom, 
or whose. You can also use those when you're using a, a who which clause. So that kind of opens up other options there for you. Any questions about the LY adverb or the who which clause? You guys have done this before, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about it. I think you're pretty familiar with that. Um, let's see, and then let's look at the checklist. Let's skip over to the checklist here. That's gonna be on the last page, 31. You have a checklist, remember these? <laughs> we have these every week. Here they are again, they're coming back. Just a review on the checklist. We've got the name of uh, this lesson for week two, Frederick Douglass or Harriet Tubman. And then you've got your place for your name. Go ahead and write your name there. And then these little boxes you remember, I'm sure. You check those off as you complete them. Don't go through and check them off before you do anything because that defeats the purpose of it. But when you get ready to set up your paper and you're either writing or typing, I think pretty much everybody in here is typing. If you're still, if you still prefer to write, I'm okay with that. Eventually though, when we get closer to Christmas, I'm gonna have you all typing. So you should be working on your typing skills. Kylie, did you wanna say something? The last few times I typed, uh, I didn't work. Like I sent it to you, but it didn't get to you. That's weird. Are you talking about last year in the class? Did you use Google Docs or did you use Word? Okay. I use Google Docs. So let's try it. You don't have to type it this time. I know you like to handwrite it. I'm okay with that for now. But later, let's talk about that. We can do a separate Zoom and I can help you make sure you know how to submit it. Okay. It's pretty easy if you use Google Docs. I do it with so. my teachers a lot. It's just some reason I didn't get to you. That's weird. Huh. Okay. Um, well, hopefully it'll get hopefully to me this it time. Works this year. <laughs> I know. Hopefully it works this year. So under structure, you have your name and date on the upper left-hand corner. That still is the same. And the composition is double space, still the same, always double space. It's the best to just set it on double space right when you open up your document. Then you don't have to worry about it. Your title is centered. And this is the title rule. It repeats one to three key words from final sentence. Um, that's still there. So when you get to that point of your final sentence, be thinking of what you want to put in your title. This you can ignore. This is only if you're turning it in in person. So you can ignore that fourth box. And then style. You've got your LY adverb and your who, which clause. And on here, just to remind you for this one, you can put the words whose and whom. If you come across a a spot in your writing where you could use whose or whom, that's okay to use those too. Obviously, both of those would refer to a person. Okay, but you need, you're going to work on three paragraphs. We're going to split this up um, between two weeks. So, but you eventually you're going to have three paragraphs here. So you need to have one of each in each paragraph. And then you've got your mechanics. Those are always there. Capitalization, end marks, punctuation. Complete sentence, does it make sense? This is when, after you finish writing, I want you to read it out loud. I like it if you could read it to a person, but if everybody's busy or you know there's nobody available, read it to your dog or read it to your cat or read it to a stuffed animal or read it to yourself in a mirror. I, it doesn't really matter as long as you say it out loud. That's so the I thing. Read it to my chickens? You could read it to your chickens. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure they would love it. So um, uh, the point is you're going to discover that if you're reading it out loud, your brain kind of engages more and then you catch little errors that you make. If you just read it inside your, your own head, if you're silently, your brain automatically fixes stuff. You don't even realize it because our brains are so smart. Um, but reading it out loud causes you to look at every word and then you go, oh, I forgot the, or I forgot of, or, you know, you got to fix it. Okay. Read it out loud. That's the one I want you to do. And then checking your spelling. Um, any questions about the checklist? Okay. We're going to jump right into the Frederick Douglass 
article. And that's going to be on page 21. So go to that page. We are still working on your keyword outline line by line still. Eventually, we're going to go with more of whole thoughts. But this still is practice with line by line. So go ahead and get your lined paper out. We're just going to set that up real quick. You can put your name and date on the upper left-hand corner of your lined paper. And skip a line. By the way, today's 9, 10, 24. Skip a line, and we're going to call this Frederick Douglass. Do you guys know anything about Frederick Douglass? Have you heard that name before? A person in our history. Um, wasn't he during, a or something? Wasn't he a what? A duke, something like that. Um, I don't think he was a duke. He was actually a slave. He, um, oh, you kidding. might be thinking of some, yeah, <laughs> during oh, slavery think. times. Maybe I'll pull up a picture of him really quick and see if you just go ahead and set up your outline. You're going to do, by the way, Roman numeral one and then one through seven. Just focus on that first while I get a picture of him here. Maybe this will jar your memory. So Roman numeral one, one through seven. All right, this is what he looks like. And, um, you know, this is from the early 1800s. So it was his, he was a social reformer. So he basically uh, was similar to what um, Martin Luther King Jr was trying to do to, to stop slavery and all that. And he was taking a stand politically. So that's what he looks like. And we're going to read about him. So then we can talk more about him. So you should have Roman numeral one, one through seven. And then you're going to go on to Roman numeral two. Roman numeral two has six. This is going to be a long one because we're doing every sentence still for now, five, six, and then go ahead and skip a line and Roman numeral three has five. One, two, four, five. We are not into topic clinchers and all that yet, but it's coming. This, this uh, class moves pretty quick through all the different stages of structure and style. All right, thumbs up when you got your outline set up. Okay. Matt, are you good? Got it set up? Almost. Okay. So Roman numeral one has one through seven, Roman numeral two has one through six, Roman numeral three has one through five. Okay. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Um, this is going to be line by line. So I think what I'm going to do is just read the whole thing first. You can be thinking of how you're going to set up your outline, but it, it's always a good idea to kind of absorb the information first before we start breaking it down. So get that a little lighter here. There we go. Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey, 1818 to 1895, was born a slave in Maryland in 1818. He was separated from his mother at a very early age. When he was 12, the wife of a slave owner began to teach him to read, but her husband stopped her. He feared that slaves who learned to read would want to escape. However, Frederick did not give up. He taught himself to read by observing other children, and in turn, he taught others 
other slaves to read. He also memorized much of the Columbian Orator, a collection of poems and speeches. This book informed his views on human rights and fueled his resolve to be free. So I'm just going to pause there for a second. This kind wife of the slave, this is the slave owners, started to teach him to read. I think it's really interesting. Um, in those days, they kept children from education because then they wouldn't know what they were missing. They wouldn't realize the situation they were in because they didn't have that knowledge. They just thought that's how life was. They were slaves. They were treated poorly. They had to do whatever the masters told them to do, but they didn't naturally realize that it was wrong until they learned to read. And then they started reading about history or the Bible or things like that opened their eyes to the truth of what was really going on. So that's why the husband said, stop teaching this slave child to read. So, but then that sparked something in him. That's what's really cool about Frederick's story is that that ignited something in his heart, in his mind to pursue more. He was like, that's not enough. I want to keep going. So then he was smart enough to teach himself. So then down here in the middle, at the age of 20, Frederick disguised himself as a sailor and escaped to New York. He changed his last name to Douglas. In Massachusetts, he began to speak at meetings about his rough experiences as a slave. His friends feared that he would be recaptured by his slave owner. So from 1845 to 1847, he lived in Ireland and Great Britain. In a letter to a friend, he wrote, I breathe and lo, the chattel becomes a man. I employ a cab. I am seated beside white people. I enter the same door. I dine at the same table and no one is offended. So that's part of his speech. They spoke a little different than, you know, we do now. But um, those are some of his famous words that he used. Um, Douglas returned to the United States and continued to speak against slavery. On July 5th, 1852, he delivered a speech that eventually became known as What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? According to Douglas's biographer, it, was, it has been called the greatest anti-slavery oration ever given. He was photographed and often looked directly at the camera to confront the viewer with his stern look. And we saw a little picture of that. Um, after the slaves were freed, he continued to speak out against separatist movements. He died at the age of 77 and is remembered as one of the greatest men of his time. So big impact on uh, our nation and on slavery specifically because of his stand. And it all started because somebody taught him how to read. So, all right, we're running out of time, but let's look back at sentence by sentence. So now that you've absorbed the whole content of this article, we're gonna break it down just like you did with the Mari article. Looking at Roman numeral one, that's the very first sentence. It says, Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. We noticed that his name was not Douglas. At that point, he changed it later, and that's what he's known by. But this is his legal name here. And then his years, was born a slave in Maryland in 1818. So we can use those numbers for free. Um, so I think that, oh, do you need this room? Oh, no problem. Okay. <laughs> um, so for Roman numeral one, we know we have Frederick here. I'm just going to circle that F in the word Frederick because I know we can use that as a symbol later. So let's use it here. And instead of Douglas, I'm going to put his last name Bailey. And that he was born a slave. I'm just going to help you with this first one here so we can get this one down. Born, he was born a slave. And even though it says Maryland, does anybody know that, um, how do we abbreviate Maryland? You guys remember that from, from your geography classes? Is it M, Y? No, that doesn't sound right. Do you remember Aubrey? She's looking. ML? Is it ML? 
I don't know. I didn't go to geography class. <laughs> you don't remember learning all the 50 states? How to abbreviate. I listened to the song. That's it. Nifty, nifty, United States. 13 original colonies. I remember that song too. It's MD. Is that what you were finding out, Aubrey? I saw you run off. Okay. So MD, and we can put 1818 here. All right. So here's what we're going to do because this is going to take you a little while. Um, I'm going to have you do the, let's see, how am I going to split this up? Let me think for a second here. I'm gonna have you do just paragraphs one and two. So you can draw a line right here between two and three. I'm gonna have you just focus on the keyword outline for one and two, but I also want you to write those paragraphs. Remember, this is year two level B. So we're going up a notch here. Your homework is gonna be a little more than last year. So finish the outline for Roman numeral one and two. Remember the rules. Some of you forgot this a little bit, you can only have three words on each line, only three. Some of you had four or five on a couple of them. So try to keep it only at three, but you can use numbers and symbols and abbreviations as needed for free. So going line by line. So number one here is gonna be the second sentence in the first paragraph right here. He was separated from his mother at a very early age. That goes here. We're doing each sentence still. And then, don't do three yet. We'll save that for next week. But I do want you to finish the outline and write two paragraphs this week. And don't forget your checklist. You have two things to underline. So it's pretty simple right now. Okay, so we're just going to focus on L-Y and who which. Any questions about your homework this week? Got your grammar and um, since I'm at a different place here, Jude, I, I might need your mom to remind me to get those papers to you. I don't want to forget that. Aubrey, did you have a question? Uh, yes. Did you get my grammar homework from last week? Because I think we tried to turn it in, but it didn't work or something like that. Let me check real quick. Aubrey, I did not. I got your keyword outline, but I don't see the grammar. Yeah, because we tried to and something happened. I don't know. So did you try from your cell phone or your mom's cell phone? Uh, I don't know. She's at a dentist appointment right now, so I can't ask her. Okay. That. Yeah, ask her later because if she has, uh, if she can download the app for Google Classroom on her phone, it makes it so easy to just take a picture and then add it to the assignment. So you can see if she can do it that way. Okay. Yeah. If you have more trouble, though, let me know. Your mom can reach out to me and we can work on that. Anybody else have any questions before we go? You guys did great. Have a great week. Let me know if you have any questions in the meantime, and I'll see you next Tuesday. Bye.